all those hatreds that this country had in its belly suddenly became unreal. The Bill of Rights. One citizenship for all races, creeds, and colors. Ladies and gentlemen. Hello, I'm Holly Doan. You're watching the 50s, a special series on a remarkable decade in Canada. It was an era of civil rights. For nearly a century, Canadians in a free country saw no need to spell out what freedom really meant. That changed in the 50s. And the reason? Watch now as we present One Canada. Bernard Wolfe, a businessman from London, Ontario, went to the Supreme Court in 1950 in a landmark case. Wolf was an unlikely participant in a lawsuit. He'd emigrated years before from what then was Russia and became a prosperous storekeeper. Wolf ran artistic ladies' wear in London. His nephew, Norton Wolf, remembers. Bernard wasn't a crusader, but he wanted to be liked. Wolf's trouble started when he purchased a $6,800 cottage on Lake Huron at a place called Beach of Pines, near Grand Bend, Ontario. It was for Christians only. Wolf was Jewish. The neighbors sued. Newspaperman Claire Westcott. There was a sign over the pavilion in Grand Bend where my parents had a cottage. Uh, you know, no Jews allowed. I saw it. I walked under that sign. Cottage owners pointed to a clause in their property titles that swore Beach of Pines must never be occupied or used by any person of Jewish, Hebrew, Semitic, Negro, or colored race or blood. The notice was legal in Canada as late as 1950. If Jews were not wanted, one judge explained, it was to make sure neighbors get along well together, he said. They were willing to go through the, the uh, court actions in order to maintain that their purity, if they want to call it, whatever, <laughs> whatever they, their feeling was towards uh, not allowing anyone uh, of, of uh, Jewish faith in, in Beach of Pines. In 1950, the country had a thriving Jewish community. In Montreal, Toronto, and Winnipeg, it numbered 200,000. Yet no Jewish Canadian had ever won appointment to high political office or the Supreme Court. None were admitted to prestigious private clubs in Canada. Author Peter C. Newman. As soon as we would sit down, whether I was with somebody's parents, somebody else's parents, or other boys, I immediately ordered a ham sandwich because that meant I wasn't Jewish. And that was my disguise. You know, well, if, if he's eating a ham sandwich, he can't be Jewish. Um, and uh, that's, that's how bad it was. No Jews Need Apply read an expose in McLean's magazine by Pierre Burton. It documented a summer resort ban. McLean's requested identical reservations at 29 hotels, one in the name Marshall, the other Rosenberg. Two to one, Rosenberg was less likely to get a room. Former Deputy Prime Minister Herb Gray. In the context of the Times, this was more, not, not acceptable, but it's something that, that was part of life. It was part of life that Toronto's Lawyers Club did not accept Jews until discriminatory membership rules were repealed in 1952. Lawyer Ted Richmond, Jewish and just out of law school, took the Beach of Pines appeal. 
It was one of his first cases. His son, Joseph. He knew, for example, that when he graduated from law school in 1948, I think he stood third in his class, that no Gentile firm would hire him because he was Jewish. I mean, there was, you know, that, that was the way things were. Almost 40 years after the Beach of Pines case, Richmond recalled it in a private memo. He remembered when a lower court heard arguments on how Jews might be identified, one judge interjected, Oh, you don't have to ask. You can tell. The land covenant was there. Uh, they they uh, were going to maintain that, and they were willing to make any effort that was necessary to keep people who were not desirable out. The Supreme Court, after three years of appeals, agreed to take the case. Judges would ask if a Canadian should gain or lose property because of race or religion. Beyond the court on Parliament Hill, the case was noticed as well. There, members for the first time heard demands the country ensure equality before the law. It was a campaign led by John Diefenbaker, MP from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, for 16 years an advocate for a Bill of Rights. There will be equality everywhere in the Dominion with fairness to all and favors to none. And that is the answer. The Supreme Court ruled it struck down restrictive covenants that had forbidden the sale of land to Jews. The Canadian Jewish Congress organized and helped finance the Supreme Court appeal. It was marked as a milestone on the road to a Bill of Rights. I think that they helped take the first step towards a racially tolerant, diverse, multicultural Canada, the Canada that we have today. I think this was, an, uh, this was one of the early steps in that direction. For the first time in the 50s, the country would ask what it meant to be Canadian and a Christian or a Jew or a citizen of any faith. For the first time, the country would ask if freedom should be spelled out in law. Historian Desmond Morton. The biggest achievement for me is that Canadians on the whole cease to hate each other for reasons of race, religion, gender, whatever, because they don't have to anymore. The Brotherhood idea is building into a tremendous force. Influential men among the nation's leaders, bankers, editors, industrialists, statesmen, rabbis, priests, ministers, all are realizing the benefits possible to a peaceful and harmonious world lying in the principle of brotherhood. Bernard Wolf, to his death, never regretted his legal troubles, he said. But he and his wife could not bear to spend a night at the cottage they'd once wanted, where the neighbors did not want them. He actually never moved into the cottage, so it became a matter of this, this is a much bigger thing than we had ever realized. And if, if, I, if I can be a part of something that's going to benefit uh, the future generations, then I, I'm here with both feet. The House of Commons in the 1950s debated a Bill of Rights. Members of Parliament could not agree. It was said no code of freedom was needed in a land that was free. An outspoken critic of the bill was Liberal Citizenship Minister Jack Pickersgill. He said, I challenge anyone to name any other country where there's as much respect for others. We Liberals believe that our British parliamentary system of government is the best in the world. There's a strong contrary opinion, which was that our British Constitution was good enough for Queen Victoria, so it's good enough for us. 
um, I mean, I'm parodying it. Uh, some quite serious people held that view, you know, that the tr true liberty uh, was in the British Constitution, which didn't require American things uh, like a Bill of Rights. Can you think of any other country than Canada which is growing faster or where there is a fairer distribution of the good things of life? Pickersgill's Prime Minister, Louis Saint Laurent, agreed. In 1953, he said, there are few countries where rights of the individual are more effectively recognized than in this Canadian democracy. That was a political statement that he was making uh, and uh, it, as part of a denial of the need. There was a need, there was a great need for uh, some greater protection, constitutional protection of rights. Roland Penner, later Attorney General of Manitoba, in 1950, was an organizer for the Labour Progressive Party. No Jewish person could be a member of the Manitoba Club. The Manitoba Club is the ultra-conservative establishment club, right? A 1946 Gallup poll asked, If Canada does allow more immigration, are there any of these nationalities which you would like to keep out? Canadians said, No Japanese, 60%. No Jewish immigrants, 49 percent. No Germans, 34 percent. The survey results were discussed at synagogues. When Rabbi said, The Canadian people are incapable of cruelty. Yet that poll should be regarded as a warning. The ideal of brotherhood, which inspired thousands of Canadians on the battlefield, may be lost. I think there was a real tension back then. I think there was a real tension back then. I think the, that, you know, new views about race and discrimination were emerging. But that doesn't mean that the older ones had completely given way. One MP said, Experience has shown freedom is not always safe in the custody of a powerful government supported by an overwhelming majority. Because we're all human. The MP was John Diefenbaker. As a conservative backbencher, he twice tried and failed to enact a civil rights bill. Diefenbaker, a remarkable character in many ways, and certainly a civil libertarian uh, came up with the idea of a statutory Bill of Rights, the Canadian Bill of Rights. Born the grandson of a German wagon maker, raised among immigrants on the Saskatchewan frontier, Diefenbaker said, I know what discrimination is. Newspaperman Arch McKenzie. Emphatic. <laughs> Emphatic in the extreme. And, uh, and uh, you know, he was an old criminal lawyer and a very effective one and uh, he uh, the sense of the court room remember he left him you were asked this question are you a Canadian and that's the first thing stand for one Canada united free and independent one citizenship for all races, creeds, and colors. Ladies and gentlemen. To be accepted in Kenyan society, you really had to be Scottish. In Alberta, Hutterites were forbidden by law from buying more than 6,400 acres in any district. One legislator called it a method of zoning. In Quebec, Jehovah's Witnesses were prosecuted more than 1,600 times for distributing pamphlets. Police called it disturbing the peace. In Ontario, Jewish boys and girls who attended public school were taught mandatory Christian curricula. Novelist William Weintraub. Jewish school children sometimes came home singing Jesus loves me, this, this I know, to the horror of their parents and grandparents, but nobody thought very much. The children didn't know about it, and uh, they were being indoctrinated with uh, Christian ideas. 
Warnings of Jews not allowed were so commonplace, Ontario voted to ban the signage in 1943. 